Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, that came on hot. That was pretty good. Um, as you will probably notice, I am starting today in the middle of the stage um, instead of stage <laughs> right or left or whatever that is. Um, for you guys, if you were here last week, you'll know what I'm talking about. I also didn't bring my watch because uh, it seems like it always talks at me uh, in the middle of a sermon. And the benefit of not bringing it is it won't talk to me. The downfall maybe for you guys is I have no idea what time it is. So we're going to see uh, what happens uh, today. Uh, today we're actually going to be continuing uh, in our series called uh, Waking the Dead. And you'll see the graphic here uh, on the screen. This is the wrap-up uh, to this series uh, where in, in a lot of ways we've been um, comparing and contrasting two different uh, realities that we can live in. On the one hand, you can have uh, what we've been calling um, life, right, spiritual uh, life, and on the other hand, um, well, the opposite of that, right, this, this death, um, spiritual death that we can um, experience. And, and those two are, are not words to say like saved versus uh, unsaved, right? It's not a, you know, heaven versus hell uh, reality. These are actually both things that um, as believers, we can uh, very much experience. Uh, the life side being um, this sense of, of vibrancy in our walk with the Lord, uh, uh, this, this life, this encouragement, this joy, this relationship uh, with Him and living in the joy of that relationship, of course, the spiritual life category. Uh, and the opposite uh, is, is kind of the, the going through the motions sort of um, faith, where uh, we see maybe what, what we want, what we desire, that, that joy of relationship and living from that, but, but we're kind of stuck uh, going through the motions, going uh, to church, trying to, to read our Bible, trying to do these different things, but we feel stuck uh, where we're at, not experiencing the fullness of it. And so, obviously, the point of the series, Waking the Dead, is, is trying to move us uh, into this category of spiritual life and vibrancy and understanding maybe what, what gets us there. Uh, the big idea that we're working with um, is, is evaluating our decisions, how the decisions we make really can end up pushing us into one category uh, or the other. And, and even before that, you know, what are our values? What are our, our personal values? What are our biblical values that we're trying to align with? Uh, the goal and the heart is that uh, when we set up those values, it's from that value system that we begin to make decisions today about what our um, choice will be tomorrow. It's a pre-decision, a pre-choice, determining in this moment based on biblical values, based on what we um, value, what tomorrow will look like. That's uh, the big idea. And, and to wrap all of this up, kind of put a bow on top, uh, we're actually going to talk about maybe the biggest aspect of all of this, if I can say that. Uh, I think it's very easy to, to come on a Sunday morning and uh, listen to a sermon about spiritual life and, and living in that or from that posture, and we get super encouraged and we're excited and we're like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have the, the values conversation. I'm going to have the, that decision-making um, conversation. I'm going to really evaluate these things. Uh, then we go home, and uh, maybe we try to put some stuff in practice. We have the conversation with our spouse, and we try to say, okay, this is, these are the steps we're going to take. These are the things that we want to do, um, but just give it a little time. Things sort of fall apart. Well, I think the biggest thing that we can talk about to wrap all of this up, all of the uh, the, the topics we've covered, the, the posture, the value on generosity, on the words we say, on, on the pre-decision concept. To wrap that all up, we're going to talk about perseverance. What does it take in this life to persevere? To go from that Sunday morning where you hear those words and you're encouraged and you're trying to do it, what does it take to keep going in your walk with the Lord? When I hear this word, 
persevere, uh, what I often think of, uh, maybe you think of the same thing, uh, I think of running, like going jogging. Uh, endurance, perseverance, those things kind of uh, go together. And, and I remember having to do a lot of running uh, growing up because I played basketball. And my coach often would share this statistic. I had to look it up to get the numbers right. But he, he would share this statistic at the end of a season or kind of the beginning of your preseason conditioning on all the different sports and, and just about how far they run in a given game. Baseball, kind of to, to start it off, not a ton of running, right? You field balls, you run bases, but certainly not the continual running uh, kind of sport. Uh, over the course of a game, on average, a baseball player will run 0.0375 miles. It's a little under half, not half a mile, less than half. Wow, that's like not very far at all. <laughs> we could probably all run outside and do that real quick. Football, on the other hand, a little bit more. Of course, it's not constant running. In football, there's a lot of sprints, stopping, going, all that kind of stuff. About a mile and a quarter, 1.25 miles, is what they run over the course of a game. Basketball, God's sport, of course. <laughs> yep, I did say that. Uh, about two and a half miles, 2.55 miles is what you run uh, over the course of a game, and I'll come back to that. Uh, one that shocked me, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing at this, but tennis um, I've never played tennis, so maybe there's a whole lot more running involved. There probably is, um, so this is not a knock on tennis, but I was just very shocked by this. Uh, tennis players will run three miles over the course of a match. That's surprising to anyone else. Maybe, maybe not, but that's, that's really far. Uh, hockey, 5.6 miles. Of course, they're not running, they're skating, but it's that same, you know, how much exertion they're doing. And then the king of them all is soccer over seven miles that they'll run. Uh, over the course of one game. Um, that's why I don't play soccer. Uh, that's why I did not growing up. That is a lot of running. Uh, but our coach, he would, he would bring out this stat, and he would walk through uh, the numbers, and he would show, okay, this basketball number, two and a half miles, is approximately what you run over the course uh, of a game. So uh, before the really conditioning schedule started, before practices really started, he would challenge us over the summer, look, you need to be running three miles a day. Three miles, because you don't just want to hit the bare minimum of what your endurance should be at. You actually have to go a little bit above that. And, and his goal was, when we get to the season, I don't want you to be winded in practices. I want to be you know, coaching you, running through plays, and, and actually doing my coaching job, not trying to get you guys into shape. And so we would go, and, and we would have this running schedule, and, and we would try to, to do it. He would often you know, check in at different times, and it still didn't stop him from killing us in practice. Uh, maybe that was just a pleasure thing for him, I don't know. But running, and it was at that point in my life that I realized just how much I hate running. Maybe you feel me on that. But you sweat constantly. You're not really breathing. You're panting the whole time. Your legs hurt during, after, and several days after. And maybe the worst point, uh, you run 10 miles, and then you pass the first mile marker. That was a joke. There you go. Okay. I just needed to get that in there. But it's terrible. You run forever, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I just crossed the first mile. Great. I have two more to go before I can be done with this. And some of you maybe in here are runners. Maybe you enjoy that. Um, you're kind of crazy, but maybe you enjoy that. And, and you'll say things to me after, which is good, You'll say things like, oh, no, 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 it's, it's so good for you to go running. It's so good for, for your lungs and for your heart and, and, of course, your legs and these different things involved. It's really, really good. And, and it's not even about the difficulty of the run. It's about how you feel afterwards, right? You've done so much. You feel so good afterwards. Uh, you just have to push through it. You know, when you get to a certain point in your run, that, that three miles that you're stopping at, uh, you actually get into what's called a, a runner's groove or runner's stride, and then you can just keep going for longer distances. Okay. 
does not convince me one bit. Now, there's a part of me, honestly, that wishes that I was maybe like you in that way, where I, I see you're running, and you enjoy it, and you have this perseverance, and I, I really do envy that, and, and I want it. I'm, I'm kind of jealous of you, but at the same time, it really hurts, and it's not very fun. Kind of my mentality back then is the same mentality I have now. I, I ran during basketball, and I'll run now you know, at the gym or doing things, not because I want to, but kind of because I have to. And that becomes the mentality. I think this mentality that I have towards running is the same mentality that can creep into our spiritual lives as well. But, but the roles are kind of reversed. And what I mean by this is you can probably very easily come into a church service, you hear all of these good things, you hear about the, the vibrancy of faith and how awesome this could be and this joy of relationship, and it sounds so awesome. And you go home and you try it. You try to put things in practice and you realize this is a whole lot to juggle. This is a whole lot of crazy. To try to juggle parenting being a spouse, having a job, and finances, and, and running to this, and running to that, and also I'm supposed to read my Bible, and I'm supposed to pray, and then I'm supposed to be in a life group, and there's a different study coming out, and I have to do all of these things, and now you're telling me that I have to determine these values, and set this stuff up, and, and try to figure, determine today what to do tomorrow. This just seems crazy. It's too much. I can't do it in a lot of ways, right? It hurts, it's not easy. You're panting. You're trying to make it through. And perseverance at that time, well, it becomes a very hard thing to talk about. Because you'll get started, you'll be gung-ho, and before you know it, it seems like things slip away. I think there are some people in this room who Maybe you've been at it for a long time. You've known the Lord for years, decades maybe. And over the course of that time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where you try, you put these things in practice, and you realize, man, this is just getting harder and harder and harder. And, and this whole marathon idea, this running analogy that we apply to our faith where uh, we, we kind of talk about it as a marathon, this long distance, uh, maybe slower jog, you who end up experiencing, no, it's not this slow-paced jog that we're going a, mile, or going a marathon. It's a dead sprint to do that marathon. And it's hard, it's difficult. It's getting more difficult to keep going. Others may be a little bit newer to this idea. A little bit newer to the church, newer to the faith. And you've already started to realize that it's not as easy as it sounds in that sermon to put these things in practice and keep going. I want to talk very honestly about it today, very honestly about perseverance. What does it take to persevere, to keep going, to set these values and be consistent? What do you do? What does it take? to persevere. The first thing that we're going to see, first thing it takes to persevere is we have to count the cost. Turn with me to Luke chapter 14. We're going to spend a little bit of time here uh, unpacking these sayings of Jesus. It says this, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, these these large crowds that are traveling with him, these are not uh, necessarily disciples yet. Not people who would commit themselves and say, yeah, I am a follower of Jesus, of, of that guy. Instead, these are large crowds that are traveling because they like to hear what he's saying. They want to hear, okay, what is he saying in these messages? What are his uh, intentions? Can I actually get on board with this guy? I kind of trying to feel him out a little bit. And so he turns to them, 
as they're making this evaluation of Jesus. In verse 26, Jesus says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even hate their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What? What in the world does that mean? If anyone comes to me and does not hate, now it's important to note here, Jesus is not condoning hatred. Okay, this is not an anger, uh, kind of a hatred, right? Elsewhere in scripture, he talks about that hatred being on the same level as murder. So he's not condoning that kind of a mindset towards people. Instead, hate here uh, carries the idea of, of denying, right? Denying or rejecting these things as far as having prominence in your life over Jesus. He's saying reject father and mother and holding them in higher esteem than Jesus. The wife and children, the brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life, holding it in high, higher esteem than Christ. He's saying, no, deny those things. To follow me, to be my disciple, what you have to realize, as weighty as this is, is that Jesus is the number one goal and the number one priority. He takes precedence over everything else. He continues in verse 27. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This idea, carrying your cross, uh, literally in that context, the cross was, was what would kill you. It was a, a torture device. It was, it was what you knew uh, you were going to die on someday. And, and the command here is, is take me, my truth, my gospel, what, what Jesus is saying, take this, and if you're, if you're going to follow me, recognize that by following me, you are sentencing yourself to death. You are carrying your own martyrdom with you as you go. Whoever is not willing to do that and follow me cannot be my disciple. It's a high calling. And he launches into two illustrations that we're going to look at to flesh this out even more. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. The picture here is, is an architect, a, a builder, right, who, who is looking and they, they have the blueprints, it's all set up, it's ready to go. Imagine if he were to just pull the trigger without first checking the bank account, without first checking, you know, what are, what are the lumber costs right now, the labor costs? Can I actually feasibly make this thing happen? And if you were not to do that, if you were not to check the bank account, you were not to see if you can actually feasibly do this thing, well, that's foolish. You're going to get to a point where you've built this, this foundation and you have maybe the walls up, but then you can't do anything else because you ran out of money. It's foolish. People are going to look. They're going to ridicule you. It goes on in 31. Suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Imagine a king going to war with another king. If he were to just recklessly, okay, we're going to go for it no matter what. We're going to go for it. We're not even going to send out scouts. We're not going to see what weaponry they have. We might be outmanned. We might be outgunned. Doesn't matter. We're just going to go do this thing. Foolish, right? Doesn't make sense. Won't you first count the cost? Can I actually accomplish this? Am I willing to go through what I need to go through to make this thing happen? 
Well, in the same way, verse 33, those of you who do not give up everything that you have cannot be my disciples. What is Jesus saying? Those of you who do not give up everything, family, friends, even your own self, willing to give up your life for this thing, if you're not willing to do that, to count the cost, you cannot be his disciple. There is a cost to following the Lord. And if you've known him for a while, you'll know this. We don't like to talk about it in church, but we certainly all feel it at times. There is rejection in following Jesus. Rejection, those closest to you maybe. It is that family, that friend, those people you hold most dear. There's hurt in it. There's loss in it. There's sin and temptation. Of course, you begin to battle with. There's suffering. There's pain. It's hard. And if you're new to following the Lord, you need to know this. The Christian life is not always going to be sunshine and rainbows and fuzzy bunnies and unicorns. And we want that. We want to believe that. We see this possibility, or at least we hear about it, and we think, okay, the Christian life, I just have to get to this point, and then my life will just figure itself out. I'm going to get to this point, and then everything is going to kind of fall in line, and it's going to be good. I'm not going to have to worry. God's going to take care of me, and of course, yes, he will take care of you. But he doesn't promise bliss. He doesn't promise perfection. He promises hurt. He promises suffering. He promises pain. We experience a lot of that now. There's some that we don't because of the country we live in. But there are believers around the world today and certainly back in this day that simply claiming Jesus meant you were going to die. You had no choice in the matter. You knew one day you share your faith with the wrong person, someone hears, you will die for the Lord. Now, I want to be careful. Because this does not mean that, dis- that being a disciple of Jesus is a drag at all. In fact, in Galatians 6, we have a great verse to this end. It says, let us not become weary of doing good. That's not the intention of today's sermon. That's not what I'm trying to convey, that it's wearisome to be a disciple of Jesus. It's not. Let's not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. There is reward. There is a harvest. We see some of that today. We will certainly see more of it one day when we're reunited with our Lord. So don't become weary of doing good, of, of thinking about this and trying to create these value systems and, and count the cost. Don't become weary in that, but count the cost. Be realistic and understand what Jesus has called you to. So what does it take to persevere? I think the first thing, as we've been talking about, is to count the cost The second is to fix your eyes on Jesus. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles And let us run with perseverance 
the race marked out for us. Uh, We're going to pause right there before we finish. But the author of Hebrews is being very honest at the beginning, saying there are going to be weights in life, things that, that weigh you down. Maybe some of those things you've, you've experienced, family pressures, unsupportive parents who, who aren't really fans of this Christian idea, siblings who, who misunderstand, spouses who don't believe and aren't on board, children who love to point out your flaws as a parent and say, how can you actually believe this? You're a terrible Fill in the blank. The other side of this, of these things that that hinder us, these weights, you also have sin that entangles. Maybe this is habitual sin in your life that you've been struggling with. Maybe it's lust, pornography. Maybe it's gluttony. Maybe it's hate towards someone that has wronged you. Maybe it's just habitual laziness. Crude, crass language could be a number of things. And we've sort of categorized that sin in our lives as, yeah, that's kind of the thing that I'm always going to struggle with. And so we put it in a box and you know, we hear on Sunday mornings, we kind of get convicted of it, but we just kind of put this in a box and say, you know, this is something I'm always going to struggle with. I'm always going to have a little bit of. I'm just going to focus on purging these other things. And we have yet to give that up. The picture here that's being painted for us, these hindrances, these weights, these entanglements, not taking care of it, not recognizing it. It's like running with a backpack, of course, full of weights and your shoelaces tied together. How can you actually do that? You're more waddling than running at that point. But God, through the author of Hebrews, is saying, cast those things aside. Untie those laces, those things that are entangling you and run. Don't break stride. Keep going. Keep persevering. And then you get to the main point here in these verses. He says, let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. Verse 2, how are we running? How are we persevering? How does this stuff come about? Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured, who persevered through everything that he went through. He endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Fix your eyes on Jesus, on what he did, on what he went through. You see him, the struggles that he went through, that's the same thing that you're called to as his follower. So read about what he did. Study what he did. Fix your eyes on him and move forward. How he's called you to move forward. This fix your eyes analogy It often reminds me, uh, if you're familiar with horses at all and racing, you know that they put blinders on the horse. Blinders that that cut off their their peripheral vision. It's because they want the horse to not be distracted by those peripherals. By what's on this side, what's on that side. They don't want them to get spooked. They want them to be fixed, their gaze fixed directly ahead to run the race, to keep going that is where your destination lies, straight ahead. Jesus is saying, put up these blinders in your life and have your eyes fixed solely on me. 
That's the goal. We also see in Proverbs this analogy explained even more. Or at least reiterated. It says this, Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. There are a lot of things that can distract us. And of course, I can talk about sinful distractions. I've I've mentioned several of those things already, but, but I think what we don't often talk about, or at least we need to talk more about, is there can be good things that are distractions. Good things that can derail us and move us off mission, off purpose, off that value system that we've spent so much time creating. Maybe a starting list to that. Rest is a very good thing. We need to rest. Maybe maybe you're at a point in life where you haven't rested in a long time. It's good to rest. It's a good thing. But what happens when rest becomes the priority? It becomes a distraction. When rest starts to take over and it starts to leak into maybe a laziness, not wanting to get up and and do things. Entertainment can certainly be a good thing. To enjoy a good TV show or a good sports game or fellowship, right, with your friends and family over it can be a good thing. But entertainment can even be taken too far. What if all you're doing in the evening is going home to watch the game? Forgetting to engage with the family, with the kids, spending three hours doing that and not having any priority on spending time with the Lord. Could be a bad thing if taken too far. I think fellowship is a good thing. Friendships, even in the church, good things, things we need. But is that starting to take over your time? Personal health, physical fitness, studying and learning and and growing, these are good things, but what happens if we take them too far? Begins to throw us off our mission, throw us off our purpose. Don't let distraction take your eyes off the prize and off Jesus. It's a big point. It's hard to pin down. It's, it's hard to, to really put a label on. But I think we all understand. What does it take to persevere, I think we have to count the cost, first of all. I think we have to fix our eyes solely on Jesus and finally finish the race. We see this race analogy spelled out all over Scripture. A unique uh, situation to look at is actually the life of Paul. Because he used this running the race uh, idea throughout. Uh, We see first off in Acts chapter 20. This is not necessarily the beginning of his ministry. It's not the end. It's kind of right there in the middle. He says this, and now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. He's counted the cost. He knows the hardship that's coming. He knows the prison that's coming. He said, you know what? I've counted the cost. That's going to be hard, but it's worth it. It's worth it to me. Then he makes this statement, my only aim, my only focus, my only goal to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. 
the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Paul has walked through this. He's walked through the, the count your cost analogy. He has fixed his eyes directly on Jesus and what Jesus has specially called him to, to share the good news, to share the gospel with Gentiles. And he says, my goal right now, what I desire, I have counted the cost, I've fixed my eyes on Jesus, what I'm looking forward to, what I want to do is to finish this race that I'm running. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy is most likely the final book, final letter that Paul wrote um, before, before he died. Uh, we know from, from church history, not necessarily from the words of Scripture, but from church history that Paul was most likely beheaded soon after he wrote these words. And in this final letter, in these kind of final thoughts we have from Paul, he's already expressed in his life and in his ministry what his goal is, what he set his sights on, what his aim is for Jesus. And he says this, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I know I'm going to die for this, and it's coming soon. And he makes this statement, or series of statements, rather. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I did it. I made it. I set out with this hope that I was, I was going to count the cost. I was going to endure hardship. I was going to endure prison. I knew that the cost was my life. And I was prepared to go through that. I fixed my eyes on Jesus. I wanted to finish the race. And now he can officially say, He's been through it all. He can say, my time is coming. It's drawing near. I finished it. I finished it. This point, this statement, I wish was something that, that all of us longed for. That, that being our goal, that one day we would all get to the end and we would be able to say, I did it. I have finished the race. I accomplished what God called me to. And with joy, we can proclaim these things. Personally, I, I do desire to hear these words, or to be able to say these words, excuse me. But something that I've, I've set my sights on, that I certainly hope I will hear someday it comes in Matthew 25, verse 21. The context of this is actually the parable of the talents. Some of you may be familiar with it. Jesus was telling a parable about a master who had a whole bunch of money. And this master had three different servants, three different people that, that worked for him. He said, hey, I'm going to go away for a long time. And I'm going to give you guys each these talents of money. And in giving you this money, I'm going to come back someday, and my hope is that you have been a faithful steward of what I've given you. And so he leaves, and he comes back. And, and I think this is a great picture, even, of what Jesus has done now. Jesus has departed, and he's promised one day he's going to come back. And so you can kind of insert Jesus into the master's place and, and us into the, the servant's position. He comes back and, and he says to the servants, two were faithful, one was unfaithful. And to the faithful, he says these words that I have clung to personally. Master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. 
I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. What I have clung to in this passage, envisioning Jesus coming back someday, what I desire is that he'll look at me and I'll hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want that. Someday I've set my sight on seeing him face to face, on being able to say on my own that, that I persevered, that I kept going, that it wasn't easy by any means. But I count the cost, I fixed my eyes on Jesus, and I kept going, I kept moving. It was never sunshine and roses and rainbows and can't remember the other things I said, something about fuzzy bunnies and unicorns, I think. But it wasn't all splendid, it wasn't all happy, it wasn't all perky. But in the midst of it all, I was being faithful to my Jesus. I hope that that's something you hold on to as well. To wrap all of this up, I just have a question to pose. Where are you in your race? Where are you in the midst of it all? I imagine there are some people who have been at it for a while. At it for a long time. Maybe you've counted the cost you focused on Jesus, you're getting close to the finish line, and you know that. Maybe along the way, things have started to slip a little bit. Maybe we need to return to that count-the-cost mentality. Maybe this is your first time really understanding what walking with the Lord looks like. And you're counting the cost for the first time. Maybe you thought that spiritual life and vibrancy, this, this category that we've placed, was just inevitable because you've been, you've been saved. And so why wouldn't it be inevitable? Why would there be hardship? Maybe this is the first time you're recognizing what the cost is. If you're in any, either of those camps, what does it look like again today to count the cost? To evaluate the difficulty, but also the reward of what it takes to follow Jesus. Do you need to count the cost again? Maybe you have counted the cost. And maybe you're trying to go through the motions, but it kind of feels like you're spiraling a little bit and you're trying to figure out your direction. And, and I know that, that, that I'm supposed to you know, do this whole Jesus thing and I'm supposed to do this church thing and this Bible reading thing, but I just kind of feel like I'm walking in circles. I've counted the cost. I'm in. I just don't know where to go. Maybe today you need to focus or refocus on Jesus and fix your eyes on him, maybe, maybe today you need to put up the blinders. Recognize where the distractions have been coming up and what you need to look out for and be careful of and keeping those blinders ready, keeping Jesus in your view. So if you've forgotten the goal, if you've gotten distracted, if you're just trying to take that next step, my encouragement Fix your eyes on Jesus and run toward him with all you have. And then finally, that finishing well category. Some of us may be closer to that than others, having that eternal perspective and, and knowing that it's drawing near. My encouragement to you would be that you haven't quite made it yet. So keep going. Keep going and finish well. Don't stop before that finish line. What does it take to count the cost again to refocus and finish well? 
And then for all of us here, maybe that aren't in that category yet, what does it look like, again, for us to have that eternal perspective? To be the Acts Paul versus the Second Timothy Paul, where we've just set our sight saying, one day, this is what I want to be true. One day, I want to hear these words. One day, I'll see my Jesus. And I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. So what does it take to persevere? Count the cost. Fix your eyes on Jesus. <clears throat> How did I forget my last point? Finish the race. See, you guys are better than me. I turned away from my notes and was like, wow, brain fog. So where are you at? Um, if any of you need to talk about that, would like to, um, I would love to have that conversation. I'm sure anyone on staff as well. Uh, let's pray. God, I want to thank you for this opportunity that we've had to, to talk about perseverance and how this road is not always going to be easy. These principles that we've talked about in waking the dead are not always going to be easy, but we know, God, that it's worth it. And we know we want to follow you. And there is no perfect answer, or perfect way to, to understand this. There's no magic words that we can speak that will just make the, the difficulty go away and, and we can just easily persevere and coast. We know that. But for all of us, I pray that we will count the cost. We will fix our eyes on you and we will finish the race. I pray that one day all of us will hear those words well done, my good and faithful servant. In your name, God. Amen.